All right, thank you. Uh, thanks, Shreff. Um, all right, so plan making implementation, 30% of the exam. Um, and uh, the recommended reading list can get pretty deep on this. Um, and I guess this is the part that kind of deals with the math or the data uh, as it relates to planning. Um, so as planners, uh, information gather and collect information in making a plan. Um, it's this topic area. And so there's a lot of things about population forecasting in the census and um, using information, the communication guide is what I'll cover in here. But these are the recommended reading lists as well as the PAS reports. Um, and so what does this er uh, topic cover? Uh, how to conduct research, acquiring knowledge, spatial analysis, uh, public engagement, communication, preparing the plans themselves, formulating plans and policies, plan implementation, monitoring and assessment, um, project or program management, and then um, last but certainly not least, social justice. So these are the topics uh, within this sort of umbrella category. Um, so quantitative research, it is um, basically the data. And so we Within this area, we are talking about population estimates and projections. Uh, there's a term called shift share analysis. Um, know, these, know these terms. Um, again, Trevor mentioned the Wikipedia level understanding of, of law. That's sort of what you need for shift share analysis and how regional scientists use uh, data uh, to calculate a region's proportional share of, of an economy. Um, Comparing alternative lives with unequal lives, budgeting, finance and cost analysis, benefit cost analysis. Uh, so related to quantitative research, we have data. Um, there's three different types of data. We have discrete data, which is a set of finite values. So it's a count or score, integers only. Um, continuous data is data that exists along a range. Um, temperature uh, or height, um, as an example, then we have nominal data where we assign numbers um, to different things. So um, basically, you know, good and bad, and we've assigned, uh, you know, one or two. Um, related to the data, we have different types of scales. We have an ordinal scale, which the number indicates a position on a list or a ranking. So that's an ordinal scale. An interval scale is measurement between values. Um, where it's proportional uh, through the range. So time or a ruler. Um, and so the, di the difference between values is proportional. And then we have ratio where the intervals are independent of the unit of measurement. And what I mean by that is um, like floor area ratio uh, measures square feet of a building to square feet of a parcel, uh, but it's expressed as a ratio of just a number. So that, not, that ratio is independent of the unit of measurement. So um, FAR is expressed as a, as a number and not um, a square foot. So uh, some of the key terms of variance, um, it's the measure of how far numbers are spread out. Uh, standard deviation, the measurement of variability or dispersion around a mean, uh, which is the square root of a variance. And so how typical numbers differ from the rest. And so uh, there's a low standard deviation, a high standard deviation, uh, and then Z score. All of this relates to the bell curve. If you uh, go on Wikipedia and read the article on bell curve, it should give you, I think, a real solid understanding for some um, uh, the type of information or knowledge you're going to have for this exam. And so you may be asked that uh, your survey results have a high standard deviation. What does this tell you? It might tell you that there's not a lot of agreement and that the numbers are spread real far apart. That's the, um, the type of understanding you'll have to have for the exam. Um, we have a mean, median, mode, and range. Four key terms as it relates to um, quantitative research. So the mean is just your average, that median, that value that divides um, a group of numbers into two equal parts, a mode, the value with the highest frequency, and then the range is the difference between the largest and the smallest values. And so, um, a couple of, of data sets here, and I'll just, in the interest of time, kind of blast through them. So the mean 
on these number sets, you add up all of those numbers on the left here, um, you would add up all these numbers and then just divide it by the number you get the average. Um, one thing I do wanna say, so the median is the number that's going to put this into two equal parts. So if you lined all of these numbers up in order, so three, 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 four, six, six, if you put them in numerical order, what's the number that uh, is right in the middle that splits the, um, the number set into two equal parts. Uh, this has an odd number of, of uh, values. So there is one number, it's the number eight that puts these two into two equal parts. Um, so let's see, there's six, uh, 12. So there's 19 values. So number eight um, sits in the middle and I have nine values on the left and nine values on the right. Um, when you have an even number set, there isn't one value that splits those numbers. And so to calculate the median of a, uh, an even data set, you take the two numbers in the middle and you take the average of those two numbers. Um, the mode, the number that uh, occurs with most frequency. So on the, note, on the one on the left, we have three occurs three times, six occurs three times. So you would write that as three comma six. Um, on this one, there isn't any value that uh, occurs more than once. So they actually all occur the same amount of times, which is one. So your mode is all values. And then the range is very simple to calculate. You take the highest value, subtract the lowest value, and uh, you get the range. Um, other things related to quantitative research, we have the US Census. It's a count of everyone living in the U United States. It's conducted every 10 years. It's mandated by the US Constitution. And uh, it's used to distribute congressional seats to states. It's um, what cities and communities use um, to make decisions on community services. Um, and it's how the federal government disperses $400 billion in funds down to the local state uh, and tribal governments each year. So uh, it's very important to, uh, to planning. Um, and so we're on the cusp of uh, another survey uh, census release, I would think soon, maybe in the next year or so, but um, we're far enough past the 20, uh, 2010 census that I don't think uh, there would be questions specific to uh, census information and census results, but know what the census is. And I think uh, generally know about population trends um, in, the, in the country. Um, surveying, be familiar with the different types of survey tools that are available. Uh, we have face-to-face -face surveys, telephone surveys, mail surveys, or web-based surveys. Those are essentially the four types. Um, so a shopper intercept survey is a face-to-face -face survey. Know when you should use a certain survey method. Um, as a planner, you need to know, uh, they might tell you what group you, you need to collect information from. And you'll need to know which survey method is best and understand the pros and cons to each. And uh, as it relates to sample size, you're not going to have to um, go through a statistical analysis to figure out the exact sample size you need, uh, but you'll need to know what sample size do you need to make assumptions on that population, uh, what a confidence level would be and uh, how to calculate a response rate. Qualitative research is different than quantitative research. Uh, qualitative research gathers information that is not necessarily a numerical form. It's descriptive data and it's harder to analyze. Uh, I'm working on a project now where we're trying to sort of mine through people's open-ended text responses. Um, it's very tough to analyze that data. And so unlike numbers where you can uh, uh, get a, a, you know, scientific uh, um, value to the response, a qualitative analysis, it yields data in words and images. So it's, it's tougher to analyze, but uh, we can obtain a lot of uh, information as planners through there. And so field research, conducting interviews, holding focus groups, even taking photos is an example of qualitative research. Uh, mapping and GIS, uh, maps are a very powerful way to, um, to help planners tell their story. Um, and for many, uh, maps are easy to understand than a large database or spreadsheet of information. So uh, GIS is 
takes those databases and those um, Excel files and can can plot them and map them. And so GIS is used for collection and analysis of modeling spatial and geographic data. It's common in, in planning offices. Uh, the cost has decreased. We're putting it on the web now through web GIS and and the uh, it's giving planners, I think, a lot more analytical skills. Um, and we're also dealing with uh, big data and IoT, uh, the Internet of Things. And so uh, just the data that's become available, uh, GIS, I think, is becoming more critical to uh, the day to day work of planners and um, just need to know about it. You don't. And the questions won't be specific to a specific software product. I know a lot of planning departments, um, most of them use Esri technology. It's not going to be specific to ArcGIS or ArcMap. Um, but know what GIS is, how it's used. And that maps don't always necessarily show locations with areas and distances, but you can do special analysis to show how things are related to help detect patterns. Um, and there's some, some different terms. Um, you know, a coral uh, pref map, a, a heat map, um, maps that use symbology on them, um, uh, walk sheds, uh, walk times. Um, another thing sort of related to this as we uh, create uh, our plans, there um, is an agreed upon or established um, color scheme for planners. And I always say, I can always tell when I walk into a, a city hall where I know the engineer is doing the, the zoning map and it's, it's colored uh, all different types of, of colors and that seems to have no rhyme or reason and, and uh, clearly unaware of the, um, the land-based classification system that the APA has published with, uh, with colors. So there is a color scheme. Uh, know it, know that yellow is residential, green is open space, uh, purple is industrial. Um, public engagement, public engagement is the core of the planning profession. Uh, it is our job as planners to make sure the public is involved effectively with a special goal uh, to include low income, minority and historically underrepresented communities. Getting into this social justice area here. Um, look at the code of uh, ethics. The very first thing is our, our commitment to the public. Uh, so it's important, it informs the public, it helps protect the public, um, it results in better plans, it helps bid, uh, build consensus, and perhaps more importantly, it increases the likelihood of a plan's implementation. And so um, different participation methods, I mentioned the surveys, you'll also need to know what participation methods are best. Uh, a meeting, a presentation, a workshop, uh, a survey, uh, know about the concerns, I guess, of sample size, of cost, of possible bias. If you have to do a, a workshop with elderly um, uh, population, you know, a text to vote uh, might not be the, the best case for you. And so I think they would give you uh, extremes. They're not going to say uh, you're reaching out to, you know, a very diverse population. Um, how effective would a Facebook um, outreach campaign be. I think they would uh, give you some demographic, uh, which would lead you to believe that they might be um, maybe not as plugged in or uh, not likely to uh, participate in a web. You know, if you had to survey the homeless population of your community, what would you do? And it might be then a face-to-face -face survey. So understand when you might deploy which type of method. Uh, visioning sessions, SWOT analysis, uh, know what a charrette is. Uh, when it's used, uh, project websites, and then the, uh, the Delphi method. Uh, Delphi method, one of these equator questions, um, goes back to the RAND Corporation trying to determine um, what sites that the Soviets would uh, likely strike with a missile attack back in the Cold War. And uh, basically, it's rounds of policy thinking. And with each round, every every uh, participant or every group of participants is encouraged to listen to um, everyone's response and you're encouraged to change your answer. And so in that uh, Soviet missile um, uh, scenario back in the Cold War, um, groups of people would sort of present what they believe would be the missile strikes and they would listen, everyone would listen to everyone's thoughts and rationale. They would go back, they'd have another round of thinking 
and you're encouraged to change your answer. And round after round after round, if everyone is changing their answer, you will converge on a um, on one answer. That's called the Delphi method. Um, and so it's uh, rounds of policy thinking that help uh, help make a decision. Uh, social media in today's world, uh, use of social media is important. Uh, Trevor mentioned um, something earlier with the uh, you know the ASPO and if the APA had a um, had an exam, they're going to test you about their uh, their own organization. APA when the APA goes out of their way to publish a a guide. Um, um, pay attention. Uh, so the APA has a, a communications guide. Uh, read through this. Know how, as a planner, we can use social media uh, for good and bad, um, and know how to keep uh, the, our constituents informed. Uh, there are things called sunshine laws, uh, Open Meetings Act, um, Open Meetings Law. I understand they vary by state, but um, you know, with the plan, uh, any town. Uh, USA ha hat on, you just need to know that, um, you know, we need to be making decisions uh, in an open, transparent process where the public can, uh, can weigh in meaningfully and understand what, um, uh, what's going on. So um, establishing written and social media guidelines, uh, the APA will tell you is a good first step. Um, and then as it relates to sunshine laws, again, requiring that uh, meetings, decisions and records uh, be made available to the public. Uh, and social media laws pose a challenge to those sunshine laws. It can be difficult to determine is a uh, tweet or post um, uh, part of a public record. And um, so again, regulations vary by, uh, by area. And um, like all things within this exam, you'll be looking to select the best answer, not the um, not the answer that relates to your jurisdiction or is the least you can uh, can do. You're always going to take the high road. Um, advocacy, planning, uh, and advocacy for uh, planning is very important. It was created in the 1960s by Paul Davidov. Uh, it is a pluralistic and inclusive planning theory where planners seek to represent the interests of various groups within society. Uh, so it represented, I think, a fundamental shift in planning where you had, um, you know, the Robert Moses laying down the expressway to accomplish um, um, the goals that he wanted to accomplish and wasn't necessarily concerned with the interests of the different groups. Um, so that was a, a big movement. Uh, we have something called the ladder of citizen participation. Uh, so again, this is an equator. Uh, know this. Uh, those are called the rungs of power. So we start out at the bottom with manipulation. We move to therapy, informing, consultation, placation, partnership, delegated power, citizen control. I can tell you the APA and our profession expects us to be in these top three rungs of um, Sherry Arnstein's ladder. Um, and then you have Saul Alinsky and the Alinsky organizations. Uh, these were organizations that formed um, basically neighborhood activism and neighborhood groups. Um, an invitation was received by a neighborhood that was organizing, uh, that had funding. The organizer sent to the neighborhood and they identify problems. They develop citizen awareness and they create action. Um, so it's part of a process uh, for the organizer to recruit local leaders, know what an Olinsky organization is and, and how it was in uh, uh, and sort of how it helped shape our profession. So part of uh, planning is communication. Uh, to succeed, planners must have written and verbal communication skills, um, excellent written and verbal communication skills, uh, writing clear, understandable, visual, written, and spoken. Um, so be, be avoid using too much planning jargon. Um, we need to uh, focus on building relationships, conducting meetings, and, and media relations. These are the, the four parts of communication. Uh, the APA has put out a book that's called, I think, Planning in Plain English. Um, and it, it does a really nice job of taking, um, I don't know what it is with planners, but um, there definitely is a lot of planning jargon uh, in, in the text that the planners want to write. And I don't know... Um, if it's now uh, that our education and our planning education is sort of steeped in kind of a, 
the way plans used to be where our plans would sit in city hall and now we recognize there's a, a, a broader audience but um you know we use words like vehicular and you know these aren't words that people use every day and so it's referred to now as planning jargon and um, just writing uh, clear concise text is important we get into visioning goal setting identifying key issues when we begin a planning exercise one of the very first steps should be to meet with stakeholders to determine what the overall vision of the project should be once uh, the vision has been identified then we write the goals that meet that vision and uh, it's also important to find out what those key issues are. They could be broad or specific, but these issues should be considered throughout the entire planning process. And ideally, we should be addressing these issues when we make our plans recommendations. Uh, it's important not only to consider existing issues, um, but we need to, as planners, try to determine any future issues that should be addressed or future issues we might be creating with our uh, recommendations. Uh, we get into some terms now. This is going back to some of the uh, the quantitative. We have population forecasts, um, and how we estimate future populations is important for long range planning and for future government funding. Uh, so, population estimates help us assist government agencies, decision makers, taxing districts. Knowing how many people you're going to have is important as we develop um, uh, our plans. So, what is a population? A population is really anything. Um, uh, the number of cars on the street is the population of, of cars. Uh, a sample is a subset of that population. A random sample is a randomly selected uh, group of that sample where each member had an equal chance of being selected. And so that's important. And it's critical to statistical validity that each member of um, that population had an equal chance of being selected. And then a stratified random sample is just a strata. It's taking your random sample and dividing it into uh, mutually exclusive groups. So whether it's people of a certain age bracket, people of a uh, specific gender, um, what's the, uh, the strata? So it's, it's a subset of your random sample. Uh, there's some terms we get to when we talk about population. We have population estimates. Uh, and these are calculated for current population levels. So when you have a population estimate, it's, it's what do we estimate our current population to be? Uh, and there's some things that help us uh, drive that estimate, migration and natural increase. We have what's called a ratio or step-down method, uh, symptomatic methods, things like number of building permits uh, issued last year uh, for doing a, um, a neighborhood plan, maybe it's the number of mailboxes or doorbells. Uh, those are symptomatic. Those are things that tell us that there um, is a population. A projection is, a is, is calculated for future population. So what's our population projected to be? Um, and so this follows the trend line. This is the regression analysis. We look at cohort survival. Um, so mathematic and graphics that that gets a you know plot diagram where we draw a trend line and, and we're going to project a population to be this. This is important. A forecast is subjective, uh, and you can include your projections. But if we're for, you can basically modify a population projection and turn it into a population forecast by saying um, you know our our population is projected to be uh, this number, but because of uh, the new Hyundai. Uh, plant or the new Amazon facility uh, coming to our town, we're forecasting our population to be this. And so uh, understand that what the nuances of each of these terms is and how as planners uh, we use it. Uh, I, you'll see in here net migration, that is the movement of people in and out of a study area. It doesn't have to be international immigration or migration. People leaving and coming out of your city or your region is migration. And then natural increase, this is just uh, birth rate minus the death rate of a population is your natural increase. Related to that, we have something called the population pyramid. Um, and so you may, may expect a question where you're given a population pyramid and you might have to say in, in 20 years, what does, this, um, what does this community need to be planning for? And so we would age these uh, population cohorts up into that pyramid to come up with an answer. I mentioned shift share analysis uh, early on. Uh, this is a, something used by regional scientists or regional planners. It determines 
uh, what proportions of a regional economic growth or decline could be attributed to the national uh, economic industry and regional factors. Um, and so it helps identify industries where the regional economy has competitive advantages over the larger economy. Um, so um, if we look at, the, related to this is something called a location quotient. And this is another equator, expect a question on location quotient. It is a ratio of proportion of local employment in one sector to the national economy. And it's used to identify the degree of self-sufficiency. And so there's only three outcomes. If your location quotient is less than one, it suggests that your employment in that industry is less than what was expected, meaning you must be importing those goods or services into your economy. If it equals one, it's once it's expected, your local economy is meeting local demand. If it's greater than one, it suggests that um, you know you have more jobs in a specific sector, and you must be then exporting. And so, uh, it becomes then your driver of your local economy. Um, so, creating and evaluating alternative lives is part of a planning process. Um, um, so, we might have to create um, if we're doing a comprehensive plan. We might have to. Um, create alternatives uh, for a specific uh, redevelopment site or the land use as a whole with different intensities. So looking at different uh, scenarios, scenario planning, um, we need to consider evaluating alternatives visually, uh, whether it's site plans for a site or land uses for an area, and then show the development impacts or the potential for each alternative. Uh, each alternative should be evaluated by stakeholders, um, and looked at uh, what's most efficient, realistic from a cost-effective way to realize the plan's vision and goals. And then during this step, each uh, alternative should be uh, weighed given its potential positive and negative impacts. Um, visualization techniques are important. I mentioned the mapping and graphics uh, before, but over the last few years, we've had um, 3D has become uh, really part of uh, our profession and um, but know how we can present information and how uh, we can use these tools to uh, encourage public input and participation. So what are the key techniques and what can be used, whether it's you know, a sketch or Photoshop or 3D uh, drawing, how can we convey as planners what a recommendation might be? Um, I hear the, the term photo simulation, um, where we you know, put trees on a, a photo or erase power lines off of a, an image to show what an area might look like. Those are just some examples of uh, some maps or graphics. We get into plan implementation. John will touch on this a little later, but um, zoning is not planning. Zoning is how we implement a plan. So we come up with a future land use plan. Um, part of the implementation is now that zoning map, the codes, the um, uh, PUDs, overlays, transfer development rights, um, incentives, intensity, floor area ratios, bulk. These are all terms that we find inside of a zoning code. Uh, know how a zoning ordinance is administered um, and the difference between a zoning uh, ordinance and a subdivision regulation. And, uh, and just know that in any town USA, there's a zoning ordinance and there's subdivision regulations there's not a unified development code. And we understand there's a lot of cities moving towards that to simplify things. Uh, again, this, uh, this is any town USA and we're looking at kind of the, what is typical. Uh, so understand that typical administration and approval process, a plan commission, a zoning board of appeals and a city council. If your ZBA and plan commission are one body, um, this exam isn't going to recognize that. This is the, the typical administration approval process is this. Um, who the decision makers are, um, elected, appointed officials, uh, some states, the plan commissioners um, approve a comprehensive plan, uh, and some states, city council know which is typical. Uh, we get into budgeting. Uh, we need to know why budgeting is important to planners. Uh, understand the difference between a capital budget and an operating budget, how a planner prepares a budget, um, what are our revenue sources, how do we identify revenue sources, and uh, how do we forecast future spending and estimate expenses. Um, there's a little more of this uh, later on. And we get into finance. Um, 
What's equity financing versus efficiency financing? What's horizontal equity versus vertical equity? These are just some terms to be familiar with. Uh, what's market value? Uh, what's a progressive tax, a proportional tax, or a regressive tax? And um, also know the different ways of looking at uh, a cost analysis, whether it's a goals achievement matrix, a cost effective analysis, a cost benefit analysis, or a cost revenue analysis. Four different ways you can uh, explore costs. Uh, demonstration projects. Uh, these are just temporary installations that uh, uh, help a city implement long-term strategies. I suspect after COVID-19, there's going to be a lot less on-street parking and a lot more um, uh, seating areas decked into uh, on-street parking spaces. Uh, think of these as as demonstrated uh, projects. You know, people are. Uh, like dining outdoors, they like dining in the downtown, we don't need as much parking as we have. And so those I think are examples of demonstration projects that can lead to long-term change. Uh, monitoring assessment, uh, we measure measures of performance. Um, so we look at um, uh, if we want to see how effective a plan is, how do we measure its impact? Um, so we get into a thing called uh, performance metrics and measurables. So we need to um, regularly measure results and to build data on the effectiveness of, and success of our programs and development. And we need to consider what outcomes matter and how they relate to our, our recommendations. And uh, what are the time and costs that um, could limit the measurement? Uh, and in general, when we look at uh, how to determine what we want to measure, uh, they can be excellent ways to track, but we, we need to find something that's measurable and specific and can be easily, the data can be easily, easily obtained. And so vacancy rates, housing permits, census data. Um, so, and then an, an outcome indicator is a specific, noticeable and measurable characteristic of change. Um, some of the things related to project or program management, uh, know what an RFI is, a request for information an RFP and an RFQ. The APA has a um, recommended protocol to hire a consultant. It's RFQ first, then RFP. Uh, I know a lot of cities just jump straight to the RFP and they'll, they'll tackle the qualifications first, uh, or sorry, they'll tackle the qualifications with the, uh, with the full submittal. Uh, the APA's recommended um, process is Q first, then RFP, uh, know what grants are, uh, how we can use grants to implement uh, plans and again that preparing uh, our budgets. And with that, um, that was a lot. I will pass on the baton to John.